I'd like to welcome you to another study on Quo Vadis. And uh, today we are going to be taking a look at the story of Jacob and Joseph and Joseph's brothers. And this will be our study and we're going to look at it in the context of the Elijah message as it's predicted in Malachi chapter 4. Uh, but as we begin today, I would like for you to take a moment with me. We're going to have a prayer and ask the Lord for, uh, to guide us in this study and ask for his leading. Let's bow our heads as we pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for the Holy Spirit. We want to thank you for the word of God, which is a light to our path and a lamp to our feet. And I pray that as we study this prophecy of thy prediction for the last days of turning the hearts of the fathers to their children, that the Holy Spirit will be with us. And I pray for every listener uh, in the audience today, that whatever their circumstances are, that they will take a renewed courage and faith in you, that you are able to save to the uttermost, and that you are able to heal families and restore relationships. So I pray for thy blessing and thy leading now, and we pray for the presence of Christ. We ask it in his name and for his sake. Amen. Okay, I'd like for you, those of you who have your Bibles available, I'd like for you to turn to, to Malachi chapter 4, the last chapter in the uh, Old Testament, and we're going to read a prophecy there. I would like to begin now by reading from uh, Malachi chapter 4, and uh, it's the prediction of God restoring families at the end of time. And God says this, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So here we have a very wonderful prediction that at the end of time, before, just before Christ comes back, there is going to be an Elijah message which will be diffused throughout the world, and I believe it's contained in the three angels' messages, that it will be a, a message to emphasize the restoration and the healing and the salvation of families and the relationships in families. God says, I will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And in my perspective, in my view, the best illustration of God's power to heal a family and to restore a broken family is found in the book of Genesis, in the story of Jacob and his 12 sons and Joseph, of course, and his brothers. Now, in the study of the Bible, I've observed about a dozen times, there may be more, where God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is repeated at least a dozen times in the Bible, uh, a number of times in the Old Testament and then also in the New. And I would like to read to you one of those passages uh, here in um, Matthew chapter 22 and verse uh, 31. Matthew chapter 22, verse 31 and 32, and it says this, But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that, that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And this statement is made, as I mentioned to you, I have a dozen references here. Um, it looks like I have seven references from the Old Testament and five references from the New Testament, where God identifies himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And one of the wonderful things about the story of Jacob and his family and, and Joseph and his brothers, it's a view of a family that had a lot of problems, and we're going to look at that today, but over the process of time, the grace of God reached into the hearts of that entire family and brought them together, by the time Joseph's brothers came to Egypt to buy food and in the time of famine, as we will see in our study today, as he tested them and to see what kind of men they were, they were converted men. And it's an absolutely uh, wonderful story. But as you look through the book of Genesis, a great portion of the book of Genesis is devoted just to the story of Jacob. And it's a, a good half of the book. There's 50 chapters uh, in the book of Genesis. And a uh, good half of the book is devoted just to the story of uh, Jacob and his brothers. And of course, much earlier than that, uh, Abraham is also um, talked about. So 
basically what happens, and I'm going to go to Gen for the moment now to Genesis chapter 25, uh, verses 29 through 34. Uh, basically what happens is um, uh, Rebecca has um, two, two sons and uh, they were in fact twins and they were both born at essentially the same time except that um, Jacob was the uh, younger. And uh, when they were, before they were born, it was said that the younger would serve the elder. So Esau was first born, but Jacob would serve the, uh, uh, but Jacob would be the one that would get the birthright. And anyway, as, as the boys grew and as this was thought about, uh, there was contention in the home over it. And in Genesis chapter 25, I want to read this uh, verse 29 and onward. This is talking about uh, the family, how Isaac loved uh, Esau and Rebekah loved uh, Jacob. And it says here in verse 29, it says, And Jacob sawed pottage. In other words, he made a meal. And Esau came from the field, and he was faint. He was out of food. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with the same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day your, thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point of, to die, and what profit shall the birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day, and he swear unto him, and he sold his birthright unto him. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink, and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. So here's the dynamic that you have going on here. Jacob is the younger, Esau is the older, Normally, the older gets the birthright blessing, but in this case, God said, look, no. The younger one is going to get the birthright blessing, and the elder one will, you know, get the secondary blessing. And they knew that. Isaac knew that. Uh, Rebecca knew that. But yet, Isaac and Esau were fe still feeling and going the direction that he should get the birthright. So there was this contention. Well, Jacob took advantage of this situation to con out of his brother and to maneuver his brother to promising him, say, saying, you will give me the birthright. And, and Esau, even though Esau wanted the worldly wealth that came with it, he really wasn't spiritual. Now, Jacob was very spiritual. We're, we're told in the book Patriarchs and Prophets at this time, he was still not yet converted, but still he was very spiritual. He longed to walk with God like Abraham did, and he craved the spiritual blessings. Uh, Esau was more worldly, and he was more just for worldly wealth. But this is one of the things that kind of set the tone. Well, as you go on here in the story of uh, Genesis, uh, we'll go over here just for a moment to Genesis chapter 27. It says in, verse, in chapter 27, verse 1, it says, It came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so he could not see, he called Esau his eldest son and said unto him, My son. And he said unto him, Behold, here am I. And he said, Behold, now I am old and know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver, and thy bow, go out to the field, and, and take me some venison, and make me savory meat, such as I love, and bring it to me, that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. So here's Isaac. Isaac knew, and he wasn't still in, in agreement with the divine prediction, but Isaac knew that God had promised the birthright to Jacob, and yet still Isaac loved Esau more, and and so there was this contention. Well, Rebekah overheard Isaac telling Esau, hey, I'm getting old, it's time for me to bless you, go get some venison, some deer meat, and come back and I will pronounce the blessing over you. So she heard that uh, that, that had happened, and so Esau takes off to go to his hunt, and Rebekah says to Jacob, hey, now's our chance. Let's dress you up with some hairy uh, covering, and you'll go into your father Isaac, and you will pretend that you are actually Esau, and you will deceive your father into getting the birthright. And Jacob at first drew back in horror from this. He did not want to do it. But his mother was so compelling and persuasive that he finally agreed to it, but he still didn't plan in, in the interview to do say an outright lie. But anyway, that's exactly what ended up happening. And you'll read here in the book of, of Genesis chapter 27 that Jacob said unto his father, now Jacob comes in, of course his father can't see, that's why they were able to deceive him because he was just about completely blind. 
And Jacob said uh, to his father, he said, here am I. And Isaac said, who art thou, my son? And Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau, thy firstborn. I have done according as thou badest me. Arise, I pray thee, eat of my venison, that, that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord God brought it to me. And Isaac said unto Jacob, Come near, I pray thee, that I may feel thee, my son, whether thou be my very son Esau or not. And Jacob went near unto Isaac his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he discerned him not. And then again on down it says, And he said, Art thou my very son Esau? And he said, I am. So here Jacob deceives his father into getting the birthright that God had promised, and this was the huge mistake of his life. He, that there were results from this sin, as you will read in the book of Genesis, that went with Jacob the rest of his life. So he gets the birthright. In fact, you're told, we're told in the book Patriarchs and Prophets that as Isaac is pronouncing the blessing upon, uh, upon Jacob, he feels and he senses the spirit of inspiration giving him the blessing. And so Jacob leaves, and just moments after he leaves, Esau comes in. And, of course, he went into a rage when he found out that um, Jacob had conned his father into giving him the birthright blessing, and he said, I'm going to murder my brother. Well, Rebecca heard that, and she said to uh, Jacob, she said, you better get out of here until your brother cools down. Jacob takes off, heads uh, to his relatives where Laban lived, which was quite a distance off, he never saw his mother again. And as you know the story, uh, very likely, so he goes to uh, his relatives, uh, Laban, and uh, he meets up with the family and he begins working for them. And uh, Laban really liked his labor and he said, uh, what can I do you know, to pay you? And he says, I want, I want Rachel as, as my wife. And so Laban said, fine. Um, you can work for her for seven years, and then uh, you'll be able to uh, marry her. And in uh, Genesis 29, it says, Jacob was so in love with Rachel. It says, Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had unto her. And then after that, Jacob said, my time is here. And Laban said, fine. They had a wedding, and uh, they had a you know, a wedding, and then after, it was evidently after sundown, and, and Laban, instead of giving Rachel to Jacob, he slipped Leah in. She was, it was obviously dark, she was veiled or whatever. And so Jacob is tricked into marrying someone else beside the girl that he loved. And he woke up in the morning and he came unglued. And he said, what in the world have you done to me? Laban said, hey, you know, in our country, you can, we can't be marrying off the younger daughter first. The older, that would be a disgrace. And he said, hey, look, he said, hey, he said, I'll give you Rachel too, but you've got to work for me for, her another, for another seven years. So here he is deceived, and he had to work uh, a second seven years, which he did. And all through this time, God really uh, blessed his, his work and so forth. But Laban was a real conniver. He changed wages on Jacob uh, seven times. And uh, it was just a difficult thing. So anyway, when God saw, in fact, it says here in Genesis chapter 29, uh, verse 30, it says, And when he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah, and served with him yet seven other years. Genesis 29, 31. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren, and Leah conceived and bare a son. And so God began blessing Leah. So God was working with this situation. By the way, when we read the Bible, there are things in the Old Testament that God actually put up with and he allowed. And one of them was polygamy. Not that that was his original plan. But I would remind you that when Jesus came here to this earth, he said it straight. And he said, look, he says it's one man and one woman, just like it was in the Garden of Eden, and he set it straight. And those times of ignorance, God winked at, and he actually put up with it. As we know, um, uh, Abraham made the same mistake, and some others did too. 
But anyway, so the Lord saw that Leah was hated. That is, she wasn't nearly loved like Rachel. And so God began blessing uh, Leah with children. And she had four sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. And uh, uh, then she, for the time, left off bearing. Well, all, through all this time, Rachel was not having children. And so Rachel became jealous. And I want to read you something here. Um, this is Ge uh, Genesis chapter 30. And we're just looking at some of these details to kind of get a, a look at the dynamic of this family and what was going on. And then we want to come to a conclusion and try and see the major point that, one of the major points that should be drawn from this story. Genesis chapter 30, verse 1. And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children, children or else I die. Can you imagine? No, being the head of a household and having two wives that were in contention. So what happens then as these sisters are fighting and there was a contention over childbirth and then Rachel or Leah stopped having children and, and, uh, for a while. And then Rachel said well, to Jacob, Well, take my handmaid, who was Billah. So now he's got a third wife. She has a couple children. And then Leah sees this and she isn't having children. And uh, so she gave her handmaid to Jacob. And now Jacob has four wives. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine having family worship and having four wives and the contention that was in that home and the rivalry that was in that home? It was obviously not a pleasant home at all. Finally, after a good number of years, uh, Leah had her six sons. Billah had her two sons. Zilpah had her two sons. And finally, God gave Rachel a son, and his name was Joseph. And Jacob really loved Joseph. He unwisely showed his favoritism towards Joseph. And this just added further fuel to the situation because Jacob was obviously more endeared to Joseph than the other brothers. But I just want to make a comment here. I believe, the Bible doesn't say, but as it were, reading between the lines, I believe that through those years in which Rachel was barren, and as we can see from this text here, she told Jacob, she said, give me children or I die. She was very much in pain and sorrow that her, she was barren and had no children. But I believe that through all those years when, the, when her sister and the handmaids were having children, she had no ch children, that this was a very purifying process to her of sorrow. And that eventually when she had Joseph, she poured herself into raising that boy. And she obviously did some very good things because Joseph in the story of Genesis here emerges as the key actor among the brothers as far as being the one who uh, uh, was very important in this family history. Of course, there was other ones too. Uh, Jacob was a very important one. Uh, Judah was, as we will see. So anyway, you have this contention. And then, as you well know, sometime later, maybe when Joseph was about 15 years old, uh, uh, Rachel had another son, and uh, the, the midwife said, don't fear. She said, you're going to have another son. But she died during that childbirth, and as she was in the process of dying, she named him Benoni, and uh, Jacob named him Benjamin. So you have this family uh, dynamic, a lot of fighting. Uh, and one of, the one of the major events that happened in this family, too, just to kind of give you an idea, today we kind of use the word dysfunctional family. I mean, this family really had challenges. But one of the things that happened, Leah had a daughter named Dinah. And one day Dinah uh, went out and she, you know, began visiting with uh, people of the land. And she obviously got into some of the wrong company. She was a very attractive girl. And there was a man named Shechem who saw her and he was smitten with her and he unwisely took her and lay with her. He did not wait to be married to her and Jacob heard about it. Simeon Levi heard about it and this, the Bible says this man, uh, Shechem, really loves Leah. Uh, let me um, look here for you. It says, 
And his soul, I'm reading from Genesis chapter 34. This is Shechem. It says he was a prince of the country. He saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. And his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. And he loved the damsel and spake kindly unto the damsel. And, the, and Shechem spake unto his father Hamor saying, get me this damsel to wife. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with his cattle in the field and Jacob held his peace until they were come. So anyway, what happened was is Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's father and Shechem, the boy who made the major mistake, they came and said, hey, we want, you know, Dinah for our, our wife and, and relative and, you know, we want to get along with you. And, and Simeon and Levi said, yeah, that's fine. You know, but they said in order to be part of us, they said, all your men have to be circumcised. So they said, yeah, hey, yeah, fine, we'll do that. And so they were all circumcised. And when, uh, when a grown man is circumcised, it really evidently causes a lot of pain and, and makes them incapacitated. They, they're in pain for a while. And after they had done this, the, all the males in this community had been in agreement, had been circumcised. Simeon and Levi went in and committed mass murder. It was terrible, their revenge. And Jacob was just distraught. So here... Uh, this is another factor that goes on in, with this family. There's a lot of things. The book of Genesis is absolutely interesting to read. I'm just going to touch on some highlights here. I would also highly encourage you to read the book Patriarchs and Prophets and the commentary uh, that is there on that. So then one of the major things in the story is here... Joseph gets this coat of many colors. He has dreams where uh, he's uh, bowed down to by his brothers. Uh, they were uh, uh, harvesting sheaves in the field and the sheaves, uh, bow, his brother's sheaves bowed down and worshiped his sheaf. And then he had another dream uh, where the, um, sun and the, uh, the sun and the moon and 11 stars bowed down to him. I believe how it was. So anyway, that family heard this and Jacob or Joseph uh, said to his brothers, hey, you know, I was doing this and you guys bowed down to me and this really inflamed it bad and they just couldn't hardly contain their hatred of Joseph. Well, they went off to a long distance to care for the sheep and one day Jacob said, hey, Joseph, he said, go find out how your brothers are and Joseph travels off to um, um, find his brothers uh, quite a distance, about 50 miles away and at first he couldn't find them at Dothan, he marched on and when he finally came to them, they saw him coming and they said, here comes that dreamer. And they said, now's our chance. Some of them wanted to murder him. And um, I believe it was Reuben who, uh, I'm not sure on that, but anyway, there's a lot of details here. But one of the brothers, I think it was Reuben, he said, hey, he said, let's not do that. Let's just put him in a pit for the moment. And so that's what they did. And um, they put Joseph in the pit and they were thinking about what they're going to do to him. And then there was a band of Ishmaelites that came along. They were traitors going to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, I'm reading now from Genesis 37, 26. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it for if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him. For he is our brother and his brethren were content. So here Joseph gets sold into Egyptian slavery and it was like putting your brother to death, but except they were free of his blood. And in the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, you'll read a statement that tells about the tremendous grief that wrenched the heart of, of Joseph as, uh, under the treatment of his brothers and how they sold him as a slave. But on that trip, it says he turned from a boy into a man. And it says that on that trip, he, his soul resolved with the high resolve to prove himself true to the God of Israel, no matter what would happen to him. He called into memory the things that he had learned from his father of his dream, seeing the ladder from earth to heaven and how God's angels had helped him. And he had, he had a knowledge of sacred history in his own family. And this really strengthened him and he was determined to do what was right. So 
Joseph's brothers, they go back home. They said, hey, they, you know, to cover up their guilt, they took Joseph's coat. They dipped it in the blood of a goat. And they said to Jacob, their father, they said, hey, uh, does this look like um, Joseph's coat? I'm going to read here in Genesis 37. And they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the blood in the goat, in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, this have we found. Now know whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew it, that is Jacob. And he said, and said, it is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's um, and the captain of the guard. So here jo uh, Jacob is again deceived. He's again given a great load of, of sorrow and the, the original sin that he had committed is still, still following him. Joseph goes down into Egypt. And as you know the story, he was sold to Potiphar. He was very faithful. He was loyal to God. And the Bible says that Potiphar trusted him so much that he didn't even know really what was going on in his household and under Joseph's work, hard work and integrity and God's blessing, Potiphar was really blessed. But Potiphar's wife began taking an interest in Joseph. And we read here in Genesis chapter 39, it says this, verse 7, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house. And he hath committed all this, all that he hath in my, to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business and there was none of the men of the house there within and she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. So this incident in the life of Joseph is extremely pivotal. Ellen White says in the book, Great Controversy, that when this event was occurring, the angels of God were watching to see what he would do. And he gained the victory. And it was a huge decision because it involved the, the, the well, you could see the whole history after that. And the point I want to bring out here is this. You know, you may be in a family that is having a lot of challenges and a lot of problems. But if you, and no matter what they do to you, if you will hold on to your integrity and continue to walk with God, it may well be that God will use you in a mighty way eventually to reach the hearts of your family and to help bring them back together. You know, I'd just like to read to you for a moment, and I want to go back just for a moment here, thinking about Rachel. She's Joseph's mother. That woman, I believe, really did her work well. She was purified by suffering before she had him, and she really did her work well. And you know, in the book, um, Child Guidance, we have some very good encouragements, and I want to read uh, from my notes here a uh, couple of statements on um, mothers and their influence. It says this, this is Child Guidance, page 564. All who have wrought with unselfish spirit will behold the fruit of their labors. The outworking of every right principle, noble deed will be seen. Something of this we see here, but how little of the result of this world's noblest work in this life is in this life manif is manifest to the doer. How many toil unselfishly and unweariedly for those who pass beyond their reach and knowledge 
parents and teachers lie down in their last sleep, their life work seeming to have been wrought in vain. They know not that their faithfulness has unsealed springs of blessing that can never cease to flow. Only by faith they see the children that they have trained becoming a benediction and an inspiration to their fellow men. And the influence is repeated itself a thousandfold. Men sow the seed from which above their graves others reap blessed harvests. And it goes on. And I believe that's true of Rachel. You know, that, that woman evidently did her work very well. And here was a boy that was a man of God, and God used him in a mighty way. Here's another couple statements I'd like to just read ble briefly because I believe that mothers in their work, certainly fathers in their work, need to be encouraged. And it says this, In your work for your children, take hold of the mighty power of God. Commit your children to the Lord in prayer. Work earnestly and untiringly for them. God will hear your prayers and will draw them to himself. Then at the last great day, you can bring them to God, saying, Hear am I and the children whom thou hast given me. We need to be praying for our family members. I know in these last days the devil is attacking many families. He's trying to divide, to destroy, and to pull them away from the Lord. But let's be faithful to the Lord and keep praying for our families. Here's another tremendous statement. Adventist Home, same page. It says this. Page 536. When Samuel shall receive the crown of glory... He will wave it in honor before the throne. When Samuel shall receive the crown of glory, he will wave it in honor before the throne and gladly acknowledge that the faithful lessons of his mother through the merits of Christ have crowned him with immortal glory. So she was given a view, vision of the future and was shown Samuel giving thanks to his mother and certainly glory to God. So parents, be faithful in your work. Now I just want to ponder over this a little bit about the story of Joseph. Here was a man under tremendous temptation to disobey the law of God and he remained faithful. You know brothers and sisters in these last days and of course it's been this way all through the history of the world but especially in these last days this is a point on which Satan is going to make his attack to get people to disobey the law of God by disobeying the commandment that says, thou shalt not commit adultery. And we need to be on guard against this very kind of thing. You know, I have here a, a book, it's Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5. By the way, the testimonies are wonderful books to read. This is Volume 5, it has a lot of good things in it about last days and getting re ready for the last days. But in this book, there is a incident that's told where Ellen White was in a um, camp meeting one time and she saw a man, I'll read you the statement here in a few moments, but she was in a camp meeting one time and she saw a man who was there at the camp meeting. He was uh, cohabitating in his tent with uh, at least a couple women and he professed to keep the Sabbath. And Ellen White saw this and she became very concerned and she approached the situation. Now, she describes in this article here that this man professed to be a Sabbath keeper. He had also deceived the women that were with him, and he had said basically this to them. He had said, you know what? When the Bible, when the commandment says, thou shalt not commit adultery, it doesn't really mean what we've thought it meant. And so he tried to get them to doubt God's very plain command. And uh, he was just a deceiver. Of course, Ellen White addressed the situ situation and said it straight. But I want you to he listen here and see what she says about um, this, uh, this situation. Um, she says, he really tries to make sensible women believe it is not offensive to God for wives to be untrue to their marriage vows. He will not even admit that this would be breaking the seventh commandment. Satan rejoices to have sinners enter the church as professed Sabbath keepers, which this man was. And then she says this, page 141, uh, 5T. She says this, and this is a pretty heavy prediction, but may it put us on our guard, both personally ourselves, as Satan's deceptions towards us, and also the potential possibility of this problem otherwise. But it says this, 5T, page 141. So here, keep in mind, she's talking about a man who's conned women into uh, disobeying the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, and she says this. She says, there are more men of this stamp 
that is of this kind is what she means. There are more men of this stamp than many have imagined. And they will multiply as we near the end of time. Very sobering prediction. So may God help us in these last days to uh, remain, remain pure. By the way, I just want to spend a little bit of time on this because I think we need to really allow this one to um, sink into our minds. I want to read you a few passages in the Bible on this very subject. I want to go to the book of Genesis chapter 20. Now this just so happened to be when uh, Abraham was traveling in, uh, in around Kadesh and Shur. And Abraham said uh, of Sarah, he told the people in the, in the area, he said uh, of Sarah, his wife, he, they, he, they, he actually told, he didn't tell them she was his wife. She said, he said, she's my sister, which uh, was really a lie because she was his half sister, but she was actually his wife. And so this man, this um, king, uh, Abimelech, uh, took and he, he got Sarah. And then I'm going to read to you in, here in verse 3 of chapter 20. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, she is a man's wife. And Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister. And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, Yes, I know that thou did this in the integrity of thy heart. For I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. In other words, God says, I know you did this in ignorance, but I just want you to know you are on dangerous ground because you have another man's wife. So the Lord doesn't fool around with this one at all. Um, if anybody is battling with this temptation of, of sinful gratification, um, I would really encourage you to read passages in the Bible. Uh, read Proverbs chapter 5. I'll read it to you just a little bit. The lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But her end is as bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, and her steps take hold on hell. Chapter 6, verse 27. Can a man take fire in his bosom, and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. And you can read many times in the Bible where this sin is warned against. Brothers and sisters, God knows the right plan and we need to follow his plan. And by his grace, we need to hate sin and stay away from it. Just a couple more quotes uh, pondering on this uh, subject here. I'd like to uh, read to you from Mind, Character, and Personality, page 595. I think this is a very helpful statement. It says, All are free moral agents, and as such they must bring their thoughts to run in the right channel. Here is a wide field in which the mind can safely range. A wide field in which the mind can safely, safely range. Then it says this. This is Mind, Character, and Personality, page 595. If Satan seeks to divert the mind... To low and sensual things, bring it back again and place it on eternal things. Now watch this. And when the Lord sees the determined effort made to retain only pure thoughts, he will attract the mind like the magnet, purify the thoughts and enable them to cleanse themselves from every secret sin. Then 2 Corinthians 10 is quoted, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Another one that I would like to quickly read uh, is from the book Education, page 209. The misuse or non-use, the misuse or non-use of the physical powers is largely responsible for the tide of corruption that is overspreading the world. Pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness. Now this is quoting from Ezekiel 16, uh, where it's describing Sodom. They had a lot to eat, they didn't have much to do, and as a result they became degenerate. Too much food, not enough work, they became degenerate. So Sodom is described as having pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness are as deadly foes to human progress 
in this generation as when they led to the destruction of Sodom. Teachers should understand these things and should instruct their pupils in these lines. Then listen to this, it says, teach the students, teach the students that right living depends on right thinking and that physical activity is essential to purity of thought. Teach the students that right living depends on right thinking and that physical activity is essential to purity of thought. So we have all the help that we need and God will help us to live pure lives. So here you have Joseph. He makes this extremely important uh, decision. He maintains his integrity. Of course, he's severely punished for it, thrown in prison. And as you know, he was in there for quite a while. He interpreted the dreams of the uh, baker and butler, which came true. And he asked the butler to remember him when he was restored back to his office before the king. The butler forgot. And then eventually the king had the dream about the seven years of famine. And the butler woke up and said, oh, I never acknowledged this man. And he told the, the, the Pharaoh about Joseph. Joseph is brought in before Pharaoh. And they said, wow, this guy is really wise. And as you know, the result, he was put next to Pharaoh. And then they stored up the food and the seven years uh, of famine began and um, after the seven years of plenty, and then that's when his brothers came back down to Egypt. Now, you know the story basically, I trust you do. Uh, they came down, Joseph accused them of being spies, and he asked them about his father and his family, and they said, you know, we're, uh, we have, we're 12 sons, one is not, we have a younger brother. He said, nah, he said, you're spies. He said, prove it to me. So he said, I want you to bring your younger brother down. So. They said, you know, we really can't do that. He said, well, don't come back because I'm not going to accept you back unless your younger brother comes. Finally, Jacob gives in. He says, okay. He says, if I be bereaved of my children, I be bereaved. And he let uh, Benjamin come back to Egypt. And then um, they came back and they made right the money that had been put in their sacks. Joseph fed them at his house. And it's just a very moving story. I'm, I'm, I'm moving rapidly through it. And then, as you know, he sent them home again, and he had his steward put the silver cup in Benjamin's sack, and he sent them on their way, and then his steward went after the men, and he said, why in the world have you done so wrong to the ruler of Egypt when he just has been so nice to you? And he said, why have you stolen the, the governor's cup? And they said, oh, they said, whoever stolen his cup, let him, uh, uh, whoever stolen that cup, um, he can die, and um, we will be our Lord's bondmen. So let's go back to Genesis here, chapter 42. Um, so, no, I'm going to go here to Genesis chapter 44. They said, of course, the steward is coming, and I'm going to read to you this a little bit. It says in 44, verse 8, Behold, the money which we found in our, our sacks' mouths we brought again unto thee out of the land of Canaan. How then should we steal out of thy Lord's house silver or gold? With whomsoever of thy servants it be found, both let him die. In other words, whoever has the cup in his sack, let him die. And we also will be my Lord's bondmen. And he said, Now also let it be according to your words. He with whom it is found shall be my servant, and ye shall be blameless. Then they took their sacks down, and the search began, and they found the, the cup in Benjamin's sack, and the brothers, they just, they lost it. The Bible says here in Genesis 44, verse 13, they rent their clothes and laid it every man his ass and returned to the city. And then Joseph, uh, they come back into Joseph's presence. Of course, they don't even know he's Joseph. And uh, Joseph said, you know, what have you done? And the, the men are just distraught. And I'm going to read to you some here. I consider this one of the most moving uh, passages in the Bible. Judah now draws near to Joseph. He doesn't know it's his brother. He knows it's the governor of Egypt. And, he's, and Judah came near. And I'm going to just read to you from the Bible a little bit. Genesis chapter 44, verse 18. Then Judah came near unto him and said, O my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears. And let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servants, saying, Have ye a father or a brother? 
And we said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one. And his brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother, and his father loveth him. And thou saidst unto thy servants, Bring him down unto me, that I may set mine eyes upon him. And we said unto my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. And thou saidst unto thy servants, Except your youngest brother come down with you, ye shall see my face no more. And it came to pass, when we came up unto thy servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, Go again and buy us a little food. And we said, We cannot go down. If our youngest brother be with us, then will we go down? For we may not see the man's face, except our younger brother be with us. And now these are all things that Judah is saying to Joseph. And thy servant, my father, said unto us, Ye know that my wife bare me two sons. And the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn in pieces. And I saw him not hence. And if ye take this also from me, and mischief befall him, ye shall bring down my hair, gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Now therefore, when I come to thy servant my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass, when he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he will die. And thy servant shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant our father with sorrow to the grave. For thy servant became surety for the lad unto my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Now therefore, here's Judah pleading with Joseph. And by the way, Jesus Christ came out of the, of the tribe of Judah, and he is our mediator. And here's Judah, he's a tremendous mediator for the brothers. And Judah finishes up and he says, Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad, a bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brother. In other words, Judah is saying, look, don't take the lad. Don't take him. Take me. I will take his place. Please send my brother free. For how shall I go up to my father and the lad be not with me, lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come on my father? And then Joseph in chapter 45. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. And he cried, cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud. And the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? And his, and his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves, that ye sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. I just think this is such a moving story. Here God took this family. He purified Jacob. He purified his sons through all these circumstances where his divine power was working. But it took key actor, took key people in the family. Joseph was one, certainly Jacob. In this case, Judah was a key player. And they all, in various ways, uh, uh, contributed, of course, some on negatively, but others positively. But here we have in Genesis a picture of God taking a family and healing that family. And I just want to encourage you to study the book of Genesis, to think about it. I want you also to, to take this story here as encouragement for your own family. I know in these last days, the devil is working so hard to separate husbands and wives, to take children down the wrong road. And I believe as never before, we need to have family worship. We need to be patient with one another. We need to be forgiving for one another. And we need to continue praying for our spouses, our children, our, hus our husbands, whatever the case may be. Because God says, I am, a God of, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in the book of Malachi, he promises in these last days to do a special work to heal families, to restore families. So my encouragement to you is take heart, be of good courage, and may you be like a Joseph or a Judah in your family who is a key player that God can use to bring about circumstances of influence and have a redemptive impact upon the lives of the family. 
The uh, book of Malachi says, For behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So don't be discouraged with hard circumstances in your family. Maybe there's children that have gone astray. Maybe there's a spouse who's hard-hearted. But have faith in God. Continue praying for them and continue living on that steady Christian life and pray that God will use you as a good influence to win them for the kingdom of heaven. Lay your finger on the text, Malachi chapter 4, and claim it as a promise that God has promised in these last days. For behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Let us pray, and may God bless you in your journey in this world, and may you be a Joseph or a Judah in your family. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you that thou art a God of miracles and a, and a God who can change hearts. And I know, Lord, there are many people in these last days who have challenges in their families, children straying away, or even estrangement between husbands and wives. And I pray that all of us participating in this study will take hold again anew of the promises in the word of God. I will contend with him that contendeth with thee, and I will save thy children. Isaiah chapter 48. I will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to their fathers. Malachi chapter 4. If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. Uh, 1 John chapter 5. So I pray that you'll help us to live by faith, to continue on in that steady course. And I pray earnestly, Lord, for everyone listening to my voice, that you'll be with them, that you'll save their families, that you'll save my family, and that you'll help us to work on in faith and that we will ever maintain the love of Christ in our hearts for those who may be straying and going in the right direction. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.